Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about big data and we're just getting ready to get into top priorities. And I'm going to throw it over to you, Tom. Uh, give us the top priorities for the next six to 12 months uh, at the Department of Navy in regards to the, the, the big data revolution. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, we actually have a, a, a large number of priorities we're trying to get after, but we, we actually have a short list of things that we're focusing in on right now and for the next, like you said, six to 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. Number one priority really is getting after the data uh, quality. Uh, looking at the data itself, uh, making sure that we have uh, controlled vocabularies or uh, master data associated with our data. And then the kind of corollary to that that a lot of people forget is digging in on the trustworthiness of the data, um, mm -hmm. whether or not you believe the data to be accurate and whether or not you're willing to make a decision from that data. And that actually turns out to be very complicated because it's mission sensitive and it's context sensitive. The same piece of information with the same quality level uh, used for two different types of uh, decisions might be a different uh, trustworthiness level. And so we're having trouble kind of codifying that in a, in a quality perspective, in a, a quantitative perspective, but we're getting after it. Uh, so quality and trustworthiness is kind of our top priority. Our second priority is actually the evolution of our workforce or the acumen, the data skills of our workforce, right? Getting our folks to understand the value of data getting them trained on how to exploit data once they have access to it, and then getting them comfortable with using data to make decisions, real live data, and getting not so much away from PowerPoint, but digging in on, um, you know, if you have a dashboard, uh, using it for the purpose of decision making, and then um, capturing that dashboard at the time and space you made the decision, which is uh, emerging as a kind of a legal issue for us of, you know, what did you make the decision on? And that actually leads me into my third priority, which is something that we're, we're starting to see emerge now. And I'm sure everyone probably has a similar experience, which is what uh, I call dashboard sprawl. Uh, we have hundreds of dashboards. Uh, co I'll pick COVID, for example. The DOD has settled on a very specific set of dashboards for COVID. Uh, I have seen now uh, 12 different representations of the same countrywide dashboard picture uh, across different departments and different agencies in the government. The DOD has R1, the Navy has one, the Marine Corps has one. Uh, right. You know, uh, it, so, you know, which one do you believe? So we're actually going through this activity of not only certifying data sources as high quality and trustworthy, um, but the representation of that data in the form of a dashboard is, you know, we're thinking about some sort of green check mark that says, when you want to know about topic X, you go to this dashboard or this set of dashboards. The other dashboards can be informative. Maybe they're in development or maybe they're an alternate view or maybe it's a customized viewpoint or whatever. Not saying that they're not also uh, authoritative per se, but we do want to kind of just narrow in and say, you know, given <clears throat> all these advanced tools to our users, but these are the ones you really want to focus in on. And that's uh, something that has really emerged with, uh, with our senior leadership, the SecNav, under SecNav, CNO, VCNO, Commandant, oh, NACMAC, sure. saying, where do I go and get the answer? And so Pull all that's, that data in, got it, right? Yeah, really absolutely. important so we don't have dashboards of dashboards. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I'm with you. Ron, how about at uh, NASA? Give us, uh, give us uh, your top two priorities over the next six months. So, um, Luke, it's a good question. I, I think our number one thing is the cultural shift. You know, this is a strength of the uh, agency. It's also a weakness of the agency. A lot of, um, a lot of our folks really um, are taking personal ownership of their data. So that is uh, great because it shows that commitment to mission. It shows that linkage to, uh, to why they're there. Um, but it's also a hindrance when we have to sort of share it across the enterprise. So, so that cultural shift of why we're doing this is really, really important, um, you know, um, to, to share it for the greater good. But, but we're, we're shifting to making uh, the awareness of, of, of we are one agency. You know, um, a lot of folks have worked in NASA for many, many years. We are the number one uh, agency according to the Fed score across government right now. So there is that, that definite long-term commitment to mission, but that cultural shift is, um, is really, really important for us, the awareness of why we're doing it. And then secondly um, is data protection. You know, we wanna make sure we, 
Uh, we do classify things properly. We put the right protection around our data. Uh, our largest data set in NASA is our scientific data. And we have petabytes and petabytes of data actually available to the public, you know. So, so that's the largest data set, but we don't need quite the same protection of that than we do to, you know, some of our partner data, for example. Um, you know, we have our, our, our public-private partnerships right now we're doing with uh, companies such as SpaceX and Boeing, um, where we do uh, have their proprietary data um, you know, uh, that we have to protect and, and, and what, what do we need to share and, and how we need to share it is something we're really looking at. And then I touched on standards and interoperability. That's, that's a, a core thing that we're doing is how are we going to move uh, data between the, um, the purpose-built containers initially, so it's a phased approach, to more open standards and interoperable standards. So those are our our top three things. Nice, tight set of priorities there. Good focus. Mike, how about at Department of Defense, top two priorities for you? So top two priorities uh, are all about enabling the kind of cultural change we just heard about from NASA. And, and, and I'll talk about those two priorities that we're using to create that cultural change. First of them is a balanced scorecard, which I mentioned earlier. We're in the very first phase of maturity of the balanced scorecard. That's where you're reporting what has happened already. Um, as we get that vetted down, we'll move through the next two phases. In phase two, the level of maturity is about predicting the future. What could happen? Leading indicators of performance, which of course need a lot of statistical validation before you can have confidence in them. And then in the final phase of maturity, what should happen? What do we want to make happen? It's all about triggers and thresholds and, and getting telemetry feeding back out to drive operational processes through automation rather than through manual intervention. So um, what has happened, what could happen, what should happen, those are the three phases of maturity we're working our way through over the next 12 months. And there's a significant change that drives a whole new set of behaviors in the department. Um, the second priority I'd like to talk about, Luke, is something we call Game Changer, which is a policy analytics tool. Some of my colleagues here on the panel have talked about the difference between um, structured data and unstructured data. Most policy documents, most law, statutory requirements, that's all unstructured. It's freeform text. And often you get it from an image, a PDF image in the first place. So you've got to turn the image into, uh, into letters, the letters into words, sentences, paragraphs, documents, et cetera, and make it available to people to understand. Just as a quick example, Luke, we have over 1,900 policy documents at the OSD level. That's more than 60 million words. And if you really want to use that policy or you want to compare it to the US code, you need a tool that lets you not only do keyword search, but do semantic search. So you understand the intent behind the actual policies as they were written, how well they match with the law as, it's, as it uh, exists today. And of course, these things evolve on a continuous basis. So we've created a tool called Game Changer for policy analytics that lets you work through the, not only the actual letter of the law, but the intent of the law and the policy in order to modernize the way the department operates. And so it's the semantic search that's coming on strong now. There's a whole lot of work ahead of us on that to uh, in, uh, incorporate the use of that semantic search capability into the day-to-day -day processes of the department uh, as we move people away from looking at old-fashioned uh, paper, right? On Sounds to, like you got uh, a, a very good focus on his priorities and super impressive to hear that. Well, we only have a few minutes left and we always like to end with a, a painting a picture of the future, if you will, around the corner. Uh, I want to have each of you uh, just briefly describe, you know, what can we expect as uh, we look over the next couple of years? John, we'll start with you at BMC. Uh, what's it look like uh, around the corner over the horizon? Yeah, yeah, great. So look, I think it's pretty safe to say that the future is one where um, clearly technology is going to be embedded in human lives. It's going to shape how we work, how we live. I don't think that's any different than it is today. Um, there are disruptive technologies that have already brought about some pretty dramatic changes to the way that um, public and private organizations have to operate. We don't think that that's going to slow down anytime soon. So clearly the future of the government is going to look far different than it does today. We think it's gonna be a combination of technology, um, socioeconomic, 
um, geopolitical, uh, heck, even the, the stuff that we're dealing with right now in this pandemic, these are the things that are going to create the new normal for organizations, and that's going to continue to evolve. But we do think every organization at its end is going to be not only tech driven, they're going to be data driven. Um, these are going to be organizations that we think really empower their CDOs. They support their CDOs to move swiftly. They're going to develop a, a true data mindset at their core. They're going to establish analytical capabilities to help deliver results. Um, they're going to be capturing um, exponentially more data from many more sources than they do today. So they're going to be capturing new data from IoT, social media, in addition right. to the traditional mm -hmm. places that they capture it from today. They're going to realize that there is incredible value to be gained from those assets. And you'll see that they'll start treating those data assets like any other critical asset in the organization, looking for opportunities to leverage that asset with high value cases. And then lastly, what we definitely see, we're starting to see it today, organizations are gonna really, really start leveraging AI and analytics to extract even greater actionable insights from the data insets, creating predictive models with machine learning, so on and so forth. So I think all of these factors are gonna to help define the, the, the role that government plays for all of us in the future. Fantastic, looking forward to seeing all that. Henry, how about at uh, Cloudera? What can we expect? I think there's, um, you know, we're in a really interesting period. Uh, what, what the whole world has gone through, there's been um, devastation and very hard things. But one of the good things about it is I think this is a, a generational shift in technology and the use of technology from, uh, from top to bottom. Um, and, and that everyone is leveraging, uh, uh, you know, remote, remote working. We're going to have new innovations on that. And I think it's going to involve uh, greater things, right? So it's going to great, do greater things around thinking about your data strategy. Um, I, I see us shifting away from, you know, uh, point specific things like IT modernization or cloud strategy. We're actually going to start thinking about uh, more directly about our, our data. How, what, what do we need? How's it shaped? What are we going to be doing it? How, how are we going to gain, gain value? And I see this is in the near term future that much more significant strategy is going to be around that independent of vendor, independent of any of those pieces that's going to drive innovation in machine learning, AI, um, storage, capability, access. And, and we're going to see that starting to um, greatly impact missions uh, coming into the future. A lot of data readily available. Uh, Nick, how about a pure storage? Uh, what, what's it look like for you, you all over the horizon? So we're going to continue, you know, driving on responsiveness to customer needs, particularly in, in really three key areas, delivering self-driving infrastructure by building control planes and data planes for seamless integration of the infrastructure uh, to support deployment and implementation in current and, and, and really the infrastructures of the future, unifying the on-prem and off-prem experience to make the distinction between them invisible. And that'll facilitate the rationalization of deployment of data and services on premises and in the cloud. So the continuing discovery and definition of, you know, what makes most sense for customers to have where. The second one is improving performance and efficiency. So driving down energy consumption and improving space efficiency. We've got, uh, we've got a significant amount of electricity being drawn to drive these systems and they're, mm -hmm. they're supporting infrastructure and it's going to become strategically impactful. Uh, to the United States. So we've got, a, we've got a look at reducing the overall consumption of energy and materials to deliver data to the customer. And then finally, canceling technical debt. So getting rid of the boat anchor legacy infrastructures, uh, eliminating the, the, the process for letting RFPs and so on and so forth in order to let our customers take advantage of the latest technology. Our idea is that you should be able to buy it once and then it gets sustained indefinitely and improved non-disruptively um, over the course of the service life. And these subscription models and procurement models of, of as a service have really started to show us uh, in, in the government how that is possible. Uh, so refined procurement and deployment models where nearly everything is as a service and that'll relieve the sustainment burden on government agencies and budgets and cancel technical debt. Amen to that. I think consumption base is definitely the way to go. Uh, Ron, how about at NASA? What can we expect? Uh, I know you're, you're on your way to Mars. Uh, what, what's next? I mean, what can we expect over uh, the course of uh, the next uh, couple of years? 
So this is a pretty exciting time for us, Luke. We, uh, we're going through a transformation effort and digital is part of that. And we are gonna be uh, taking um, a really uh, holistic look across the agency. Uh, I've been tapped to co-lead that effort along with uh, my colleague, Joe Marlowe and I. So we're gonna be doing transformation uh, across. So I, as the chief data officer will be uh, moving up to what we call our A suite. That's where the administrative suite is and taking our roles and elevating it broader. So, so the, uh, the, the, here That's is our huge. charge. Yeah, it is. It is very exciting. And, and look, I believe this is a really a model to follow for other agencies and organizations too. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to really empower our people and partners to, to really reinvent our products, our processes, and, and really what we do, and taking advantage of, of advancements like we, we heard today from, from our fellow panel members in, in technology, taking advancements in what's changing and how we're, we're working differently. And look at those cutting edge um, techniques and bringing them into everything we do. Now, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, seven thrust areas um, uh, around uh, artificial intelligence machine learning. So not too many agency ac actually have um, code uh, off planet. So, uh, you know, I think there's only one other uh, agency and that's uh, in, in the, in the uh, Air Force realm now with SpaceX, but we're actually using artificial intelligence on other planets to analyze uh, the soil composition, for example. Collaboration is another thrust area that we have and that is how we work not only internally, but how we work externally with our commercial partners. And then culture and workforce. You know, I talked about the cultural shift in, in the last uh, uh, question. Right. And, and what, do we, what do we want that culture to be? How do we want it to transform and, and make sure our workforce is given the tools and opportunities to, to succeed? Uh, Model-based uh, engineering is another uh, uh, area where we are taking um, uh, advancements in, in, in commercial um, uh, models and how we do things and, and, and going back and looking at our empirical test of, of how we do, you know, our, our, our stacking of rockets and, and test for things. And that's Data fantastic. Is, I think yeah. that partnership of you know, the public private partnership that's going on at NASA is just uh, really incredible. Tom, how about at Department of Navy? Uh, well, what's it look like uh, as we look over the horizon? What do you see? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I, I think the, uh, for the next couple of years, really the focus is going to be predominantly on data integration, data fusion, and then making that data available to the customers of the data, uh, decreasing the time to market as it will from where the data is created to the data is consumed for decisions um, and creating, you know, I hate to say this, it's a little cliche, that single pane of glass. Uh, but give commanders the data they need, when they need it, where they need it. And then one of the unique things, which I'm, you know, I think Ron probably shares and Michael's familiar with, which is the DOD is in an environment that is bandwidth constrained in many cases. We have a highly expeditionary workforce, not quite mm -hmm. Mars Rover expeditionary. Um, but uh, the, the point being is, uh, you know, most folks in the commercial world are used to cloud type technologies and broadband and you know all, always on connectivity. Uh, we do have a lot of folks who may not have any network connectivity at all. Uh, we, they might have very limited connectivity. They might be disconnected for a large period of times and have to resynchronize with the network. So the uh, capturing the disadvantage, the 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 what we call the DDL environment. Uh, and getting that, getting the data to the folks that need it that are in those disadvantaged environments is going to be a big push for us. And so that requires us to do a lot of what I call traffic shaping or, you know, wave shaping in terms of what data goes where, when, um, mm -hmm. as well as prioritization. So, you know, is the, is the Facebook page the first thing you want to download when the submarine surfaces? I would suspect not. Uh, but, you know, I suppose that's a localized commander's decision if you want to say that or not. Um, but so that's where integrating the data and rather giving bulk data sets, right, giving the integrated or even the pre-processed data to the commanders. And then whenever they're uploading, say, sensor data, for example, to us, do we need the entire sensor suite or just the things that are important about the capture of the sensor? Uh, right. So those are the things that we're really struggling with over the next probably five years, I would say. Really focusing on uh, the, you know, sort of sophistication of what data when, since there's so much of it uh, to be downloaded. And, and trying to do that and then keep it in a sort of a real time fashion. Michael, take us home in regards to, you know, what does it look like at the superstructure at the Department of Defense over the next couple of years? 
So at, at the overall Department of Defense level, Luke, um, we're working to harness data and a wide range of digital technologies for the simple reason we need to be much more agile and nimble to serve our stakeholders. Now we have two fundamental sets of stakeholders, Luke, the warfighter and the taxpayer. And we yep. have to serve both of them. We have to enable ourselves to be better at serving both of them with rapid changes and rapid adjustments to changing circumstances. The warfighter faces some really determined adversaries and we all know who they are. We all know the resources they have to throw at some of the challenges they put in front of us. And we need to make the warfighter better armed, better responsive, more nimble to be able to, to, uh, to respond, anticipate and prevent circumstances. At the same time, we also have to serve the taxpayer. We have to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. And um, every four years, the taxpayers get to announce a new set of priorities for, for government in general and for us in particular. We're running right up into one of those sea changes or potential sea changes in we're gonna get a new set of mandates from taxpayers. And we simply need to be more nimble in government, more capable of responding to changes and all of the work we're doing around data, around analytics, around reshaping the culture, all of that is to make us more responsive to those two sets of stakeholders that we value so highly. Um, and you certainly have put yourselves in a position to, uh, to allow that to happen. And I, I, I couldn't be more pleased with what I've heard today in regards to the tracks that are being laid down, the technology that's available, et cetera. Well, that's all the time we have today. We could go all day, but unfortunately, we don't have all day. Um, but I would like to thank the guests for taking time out of their busy schedule to join us for this program. I'd like to thank all the sponsors for supporting us on the show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make our program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network.